working through uh, summaries for the book Matter and Interactions. I'm on Chapter 8, Energy Quantization. I, I like this chapter, but I don't really focus a lot. It's very, for me, I focus on it very conceptually. And it, it's really one big idea. How do we make the connection between uh, classical physics, balls, and things like that to atomic level stuff where things don't always behave the way we'd expect. And the main thing here is this idea of inter energy quantization. This is the idea that at, at very small systems, and it works for large systems too, a system can only have certain energy values. It can't be in between. So, and the change in energy values, this is really important, the change in energy, they talk about photons and stuff like that. I don't like photons. I think that uh, it promote students to have this idea that light's a particle and they think of BBs coming out of stuff and, and it's not that, okay? Light is not a little bunch of little BBs coming out of stuff. And in fact, uh, everything in the undergraduate physics material that you're gonna cover can be explained with a classical uh, Maxwell's equations version of electromagnetic waves, so light is a wave with a quantum uh, model for matter. Things get weirder later, but that's good enough for this. So the change in energy for a quantum system is, is equal to the, uh, in order to get the energy to change, you need to perturb it with some frequency nu. We usually use nu because I don't know why. And this is Planck's constant h. Uh, a lot of times we'll have h bar, which is Planck's constant over 2 pi. Uh, but there you have it. So that's, that's the main thing. Let me go ahead and show you some of the most important um, uh, demonstration programs that come with the with the textbook because I think they really help us understand what's going on uh, and then and then we can start from there so this is one of the these are all um, on glowscript.org if you click example programs matter and interactions you can run all these programs so this is a really great thing to show you how this works so this is a system with a bunch of electrons and they're at the ground state so these lines represent different energy levels so if I if I click on this I can get an electron to move up to a higher energy level. And how does that happen? Well, there's really two ways you could get that electron to move up. You could shine light on this, uh, but it, that frequency of light would have to be equal to uh, the same, that delta E would have to be, have the same H nu for that frequency to, to make the transition have to be exact. Um, or you could bombard it with another electron or something like that, hit it. Uh, in that case, you just need enough energy to get it up there. Uh, and then we could have another energy transition. This one goes up to uh, the first excited state, another. And so then these electrons are jumping up like that uh, because we're adding energy to the system. And eventually they're going to jump down. They're going to they're going to they're going to go back down to the ground state. And when they do that, they'll produce light. And the frequency of that light uh, depends on the energy change. That's a key thing. OK, let's go to uh, where am I? back, I guess. So let's look at another one. That was this absorb emit. I want to look at the spectrum one. This is really important. How do we know about the frequency of light? So here is a, let's see, does it have a, okay, yeah. So this is a light source. Uh, and a white light source contains the full spectrum of colors, right? Uh, the visible colors, which are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Uh, of course, the electromagnetic spectrum goes from radio waves, microwaves, infrared, and all that stuff. Uh, but this is the stuff that we look at. So if you shine that on a screen, you just get a white dot. But if we put a diffraction grating in the path of the beam, uh, different colors of light end up bending different amounts. So you can see what colors are present. It's very, very useful. And this is where you get the rainbow of colors. I think this is, can I rotate this around? No, I can't. Okay. So that's white light. Now, if I put not a light bulb in there, but a gas, a gas that I excite. So it could be any particular gas, doesn't really matter. Then that gas has certain energy levels and the colors of light correspond to those energy levels. So when I excite the gas, I only get certain energy levels and I only get certain colors. Those colors depend on that gas. So that gas has a unique set of colors that it produces. 
if I use another gas, I get different colors because it has different energy levels. Remember, each one of those colors corresponds to an energy level change. Now, you may have energy level changes that uh, are not in the visible spectrum, and that's fine. Okay, now what if I go back to the white light source? This is kind of important, and I get all their colors, but now I put that same gas in the path of light, and it's, it's a cold gas. By cold gas, that means that the electrons are in the, uh, the ground state. Well, some of those electrons will absorb light, uh, but only light that matches the frequency uh, of the energy change, that delta E equals H nu. Those are the only ones that can be absorbed. And so what happens is when those are absorbed and re-emitted in other directions, you get these dark lines in the spectrum from the absorption. And those are the same lines that you would get if you excited that gas. That's kind of cool. Um, okay, so now we're back to the thing. Okay, one more program. This one, uh, it's a little... We can do the Bohr model too, but I don't know. Do you want to do the Bohr model? I really like this one. Uh, let me just increase this. So this is a, a charge plate, an electron, and I have an atom over there. If I run this, the electron's going to accelerate uh, until it gets to the atom, and then we can see what happens. And this is the energy as a function of time. We'll look at that in a second. But you'll notice that nothing happened. It passed through there and nothing happened. If I now increase the voltage so that it's going to uh, speed up more, so you'll notice right here that it's increasing in energy at a greater rate. Let's see what happens when it gets to <clears throat> the atom. Nothing. Now let's... Uh, increase it even more, I think right there. I'm looking at both of these, trying to, let's see if I can make this smaller. There we go. And here it goes. Nothing happened. Okay, now let's increase it up here and run it. Will something happen? Ah, something happened. Okay, now I got one more run, but you'll notice that the, the atom changed colors. There was an interaction, so it, it's excited now. But the important thing is what happened to the electron. Well, it dropped down a certain amount of energy. Look at this energy change from here to there. If I want to do the same thing for this lower electron, that energy change would drop it down here below zero, so it couldn't have negative kinetic energy, so it didn't interact. It didn't have enough energy to make that interaction. Now let's increase this energy more and see what happens. Run it again. And there's one important thing to show here. It did interact. And you'll notice that the interaction energy from here to there is the same for this atom. It still had the same interaction because that interaction depended on the uh, energy levels in the atom. If you have enough energy to have an interaction than you do and you lose that energy and the electron moves on. Okay, let's look at the Bohr model and then we can just, we'll be done. So it, the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom says that the proton is like the sun and electrons are like planets orbiting, except that they can only orbit at different energy levels. And so this is a plot of the electric potential as a function of distance, right? And these are the energy levels that are allowed. Um, and then you can you can change up, up, up. And then when it comes down, it produces light of that color. Okay. Now the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom is very useful and very nice, but I will point out that it does have a very big problem. And that's that electrons do not orbit in circular paths around atoms. When you take the next physics course, you can see that an accelerated electric charge will produce light. And if this is moving in a circle, then it's accelerating and it would produce light. And if it produces light, it would have to lose energy. And so what would happen is that these electrons would radiate energy and collapse into the, into the nucleus and that doesn't happen. So we don't really talk about trajectories of electrons in quantum systems. We just talk about probabilities, but that's not really for this course. You'll, you'll talk about that in your chemistry course. You'll talk about that in your physics course. Okay, so I'm done with chapter eight. I'm going to move on to chapter nine because uh, it's important too, but there, there's a lot of important stuff here. I just don't like to do any of the problems because one, I don't like the photon thing, and two, there's only a couple problems that really make sense and they're really not that interesting to do. So that's that.